So no one knows the Father but the Son. And to whom the Son is pleased to reveal him. Our wills. Our purposes. Our, it is designed that way. Remember, Christ came to fulfill or to do the bidding, the work of the Father. He came to please the Father. So whatever Christ does it is under the directive or the direction or the purpose of God, the Father. And so, and so it is with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not go outside the details of the Father or the Son. They are three in one purpose. Three with one will. Same will. Also, let's look at Romans 11. Remember, we are dealing with Romans 11, 33 to 36. Now, we're going to transition now from Galatians 3, 21 to 25. And we had read 2 Peter chapter 3. Was eight and nine. So, so now let's now analyze how these things fit in together. Remember, we are talking about God's inscrutable ways. So now let's go back to Romans 11, 33 to 36. Yes, we, we read it before, but let's read it again so that we can have it clear in our minds. Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depths. Of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the one of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who, who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him. For him, and through him, and to him are all things. Be glory forever. Amen. That's in, the that's in New King James Version. But let's look at the Amplified Version. Verse 33. All the depths of the riches and wisdom of God, how unfathomable, inscrutable, unsearchable are his judgment, his decisions, and how untraceable, mysterious, undiscoverable are his ways, his method, and his paths. So remember, I said that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has given us all things. Who us? The believer, the elect, his child, his, his sons, his daughters. Given us all things. But now he says that the depths of the wisdom and the wisdom of God. Spiritual things can only come through a spiritual discerning. That is given to us by the Spirit of God. And we see that we know things in part. So now, let's consider this statement. Who had understand his thoughts? Or who has ever been his counselor? Who had understand God's thought without revelation by the Holy Spirit? Or who had ever been his counselor? Who had ever given God any advice? Can you give God advice? God does not need any advice from us. We cannot counsel God. Who has been his counselor? The question further asks is, who was present in God's counsel? When God had a counsel, the counsel of his will, the only persons present were the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so the question for this is this, who was present in God's counsel when all things were planned, purposed, and fixed according to God's sovereign will for man's salvation. Remember, we said that God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And he's not slack concerning these promises. As men come slackness. But who was present when God was fermenting or formulating his plan of salvation? Who was there? Who was there that gave input? In fact, your input or my input is unworthy. It's useless. It, has, it means nothing. Now let's go back again to, how, to, to John Calvin. A book, The Bond of the Will, page 67. God is that being for whose, for whose will no cause or reason is to be assigned. As a rule or standard by which it acts. Seeing that nothing is superior or equal to it, but it, it 
but it is itself the rule of all things. What he what he is really saying that God is a being a person that you cannot give that you can assign any cause or reason to his action. You don't you cannot because if a cause or action could be assigned to God's will or God's purpose or God's plan or God's doing, then that thing will become greater than God. That thing will keep God in, 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 in like bondage or, or under confinement or restrict God's action. So nothing, no action, no cause, no law can hinder God. God is the, he's the law giver. He's the, he's the first cause of every action. There can be no cause greater than God. There cannot be any effect that limits God. If God does something, the effect of that action cannot limit him further. That's what he's saying. So God is that being for whose will no cause or reason is to be assigned. As a rule or standard by which it acts. Seeing that nothing is superior to or equal to it. But it is itself the rule of all things. For it, it acts. For if it acted by any root or standard, or from any cause or reason, it would be no longer be the will of God. Wherefore, what God wills is not therefore right, because he, he ought, he ought, or ever bound so to will. But on the contrary, what takes place is therefore right, because he wills it so. So what he's saying is that. God doesn't will something, or God's will is not because something is supposed to be right. You know, we, we, we say, like, you, you, you have to do something, some action, like a man would say, you have to do some action because it is right. You have to obey the law because it's the right thing to do. But God is not like that. God's will is not limited like that. Something is not, God does not act because something is right. But whatever God does is right. Amen. His intent is that whatever He is, is righteousness. Whatever he is, is holiness. So whatever God does, it is right and holy. That's why Paul said, is there any unrighteousness with God? He said, God forbid. No, it cannot be. It cannot be that whatever God does, unrighteousness can be ascribed to his actions. No. It might seem that way to a human being, to a human intellect, a human understanding, but whatever God does is holy. Not that the action makes God holy. Because God is holy, his actions are holy. Hmm. A cause and a reason are a sign for the will of the creature, but not for the will of the creator. So we assign cause, intent, and reason to act of a creature. This action or this thing cause a person to behave a certain way. The reason why a person is acts out in his adult life because he was maltreated as a, as a youth. His behavior was influenced by society, by poverty, by sickness. So we try to ascribe behavior because of conditions, but not so with God. No condition can limit God or, 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 even, or even place upon God any burden. It cannot. He's above that. Whatever God does, he does of his own will, his sovereign will, his own design, his own purpose, his own intentions. There's no limitation upon God. In fact, the, the, the things that I said that are revealed to us, that are given to us, that are given to us is by God's intention. They have what have been preached, what have been re, re, revealed, what have been discovered, or, or is discoverable in His Word or by the Spirit, are given to us. It's for us and our children. But the secret things of God belongs to God. Amen. You cannot delve into those things. In fact, you don't even know. It is a fundamental truth, and it's fallacy to think that you know everything about God. We make statements like, if God is loving, he would not, and then we add, send a sinner to hell. 
We put a condition, a label, and a condition again. If God is holy, he would not confine sinners in hell. Or he would not let evil continue to reign or, or operate in the earth. We try to say it and, and frame things in that perspective. But because you're human, that's not how God is. You don't know the secret man of God. The secret things of God belongs to him. You do not know on what basis God acts. The only way you know is what he reveals to you about himself. So if God said that he's holy, it's because he revealed that to you. He wants you to know he's holy. If God says to you that he's loving, he reveals that truth to you that he's loving. If God says to you that he's not omnipotent, he reveals that truth to you. But there are other things about God that you do not know and you will not even know. We cannot fully know God. How can a finite mind understand our infinite God? His, his ways are past finding out. Let's go back to Romans chapter 11 again. Romans 11. Verse 34. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has understand his thoughts, or who has ever been his counselor? Who? So the obvious answer is there is no creature, there is or was no creature, angel, or man present when God's counsel was called. Only the eternal God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who were and are the originating cause, the meritorious cause, and the efficient cause of salvation. They were the only three that were present when God formulated the plan of salvation. Eyes had not seen, ears had not heard. It had not entered the thoughts of man, the things that God had prepared. But the Spirit had revealed those things to us. Because it's such the deep things of God. And the deep things of God that are necessary to be revealed are, are only to be revealed. He does not reveal to us undiscoverable truths that the Father had not intended to be disclosed. The Holy Spirit will not reveal something to you. Oh, you know, I had a vision from God. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me this. You are lying. The Holy Spirit only speaks according to the word of God. What Christ has done. What Christ's intentions are. What the Father's intentions are for mankind. The Holy Spirit revealed those things. He doesn't go and delve into unsearchable things of God and reveal them to you. And you have some special knowledge. Special revelation is according to the word of God and is based upon the word of God. Oh, the Holy Spirit speaks to me every day. He speaks by the word. When we read the word of God, it is God's word. It is God's revelation to mankind. How do we interpret it? Well, he gives you insight. He gives you understanding. You know something? We have to search the scriptures. We have to delve into it. We have to study it day by day. Study to show yourself a proof unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing word of truth. If you are a lazy individual, don't expect revelation from God to make you super inspired. Because with the revelation, God gives you the ability. He gives you the desire. He gives you the motivation. He gives you the intent, the right intentions. So now, you cannot have a revelation from God and uh, nothing from God and uh, don't have the physical capacity to accept or to, or to utilize what God has given to you. He also gives you a special anointing to be able to function according to your spiritual knowledge. It, it, it's common sense. If you have knowledge of God and God wants to use you for a specific task or purpose, He also must enable you physically. He enables you spiritually. He enables you physically. He gives you the right patience, the right frame of mind, the right understanding to function. If anyone is lacking, you'll be, you will cannot be able to be used by God effectively. Because we are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. All three aspects of us must be, must correlate together and be, uh, be, uh, be edified and be united. That again, Go back to what Jesus said. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
your soul, your mind, and your strength, your vigor, your passion. So you, you're talking about emotions and intellect and reasoning and imagination and affections, feelings, motivations. Now let's go now. So now we said that who has been his counselor? Now let's go to verse 35, Romans eleven thirty-five. 35. Or who has first given God anything that he might be paid back or that he could claim a recompense? Who has first given God anything? Who was the first to give God anything that you can claim that you must be repaid? God is no man debtor. No one can give God anything or demand anything back from him which God has not first given unto them or to which God has not a prior right or claim upon. So it is not by giving that you that God bless you. When we give to God, we give it out of obedience and we give it out of love. Not as a, a tool, not as a way for God to then turn around and bless us. God will bless you. All the promises of God are yes and amen. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now God made a statement that he caused the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Because God is benevolent, because God is loving and kind and gracious, he, call, he, he blesses everyone. When the rain falls, it doesn't only fall upon the righteous. It falls upon the just and the unjust. The deserving and the undeserving. Because God is benevolent. All the laws of nature work for the benefit of mankind. Gravity will work for the ungodly as it will work for the godly. The same restriction that, that gravity places upon the godly, it places on the ungodly. A godly man cannot say, I'm going to jump from a window, and, be, and because I'm a Christian I'm a, 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 and God loves me, I will not fall to the ground and die. If you jump up the window and you're high enough, if you fall to the ground, you're going to die if you are a child of God or you are not a child of God. The same effect is going to be placed upon you. Same, same limitations. When rain falls, because the rain will fall on the just and the unjust. Sometimes too much rain falls and we have flooding. Floods will affect the just and the unjust the same way. It doesn't bypass the just. But it's all according to God's grace. All according to his mercy. So, we have no claim upon God. I cannot give tithe and offer and then claim that God is going to bless me. I cannot say that I have a bank in heaven. I can withdraw at my own, at my own discretion. No, it doesn't work like that. Whatever we give to God, he first must give to us. You cannot give God anything that he has not given you first. He has given, he has given you all things already. All things that pertain to life in God. Whatever he has given to you, you give back to him. Out of appreciation. Out of thanksgiving. Out of worship. Out of love. Out of fellowship. Out of obedience. So let's look, let's look, look how Job puts it. Job, a uh, Job, sorry, Job 4, 41, 11. So let's go to Job. 41 verse 11 who has first given me that I should repay him whatever is under the whole heaven is mine therefore who has a claim against God God who made the unmastered crocodile who have a claim against God Romans eleven thirty five. who has first given to God that he must repay him again a person does not, by any good works, duty or service, give anything to God that places him under any type of obligation to them. Therefore, no one receives anything from God by merit. Everything that God bestows is according to his sovereign grace and will. We cannot claim anything from God because of our merit, of my good doing, my good works, my good behavior, my good attitude, my righteousness, my holiness. You cannot claim nothing from God under on on those bases. So it's not by merit. It's not by works of righteousness that we are saved. 
Whatever we do, in fact, we are obligated to do. As I said, two ways that you give to God. By obligation and by love, which is similar to obedience, love and obedience. We are obligated to worship God. We are obligated to praise God. We are obligated to be holy and righteous before God. He, said, he says, be ye holy for I am holy. That is our obligation. We are obligated towards God, but God is not obligated towards us. God does not have to save anyone. God, God does not have to save one man. All have sinned. Remember, we, we, we read in Galatians that God has confined us all under sin, uh, under the sin of disobedience, so that he in turn could now bestow mercy on us. So it's the same concept that we are following. It's the same trend of thought. Same understanding. We are obligated to God, but God is not obligated to us. But you see, God is no man's debtor. He's not ungracious. He's not unfaithful to forget our labor of love. Whatever we do for God, he will repay us. Not because he's obliged to us, but because he's gracious. That is the concept of grace. He gives to us freely. He has given us all things freely. Without any obligation. Remember, we said, who was present when God formulated the council of his will pretend to salvation. Who was present? No one but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who gave him advice? Salvation is a complete work. It was before man. It was before the earth was created. Before the heaven and space and time. That's why he said it's eternal. It's eternal work. So before all, all things, all creature, all creation, God has already made his plan. So he will, he will do things according to his will. What brings God pleasure? His good pleasure. What brings God like joy and glory? He does. So that's why he said, Therefore, no one receives anything from God because of merit. Everything that God bestowed is according to his sovereign grace and will. Now let's go further. In that same verse, Romans 11, in the last clause, that he might be paid back or could claim a recompense. So we, says, we have said that who has first given God anything? So now let's consider the second part, the second clause, that he might be paid back or he could claim a recompense. This is not income tax. You know, you claim a refund. You overpay the government too much taxes and you claim a refund. God is not the, go God is not the government. And you can claim something back. A lot of give to you in abundance. So now you've got to give back to me. Or I give you too much. You know, I spend too much time in your presence. I spend too much time in studying your word. I spend too much time praying. So now, Lord, you gotta, you gotta add, add, like, add some more time to my, to my day. Let no, let no nature, let no uh, time work for me in a more beneficial way. No, 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 no. If God chooses to do, it, He will do it. But if He doesn't, tough luck. So now that He might be paid back, I could claim a recompense. We must understand that it is impossible. That there should be any merit in a creature. Therefore consider the following facts. A creature has. Does. Not have. Anything. He has or does not have anything. But what he receives from God. If God gives. Because of his grace. If he doesn't give. It's still of his grace. A creature does nothing. But what he is obligated to do. And then not by his own strength. Even me standing here, preaching, teaching, worshiping God, it is not by my own strength. I still need God's strength. I still need the ability to speak. I still need the Holy Spirit to encourage me and to empower me and to strengthen me. 
So whatever I do, I still need strength from God to do it. You know, this ear around me. God must give me the ability to believe that ear. If my lung does not work, the ear will not benefit me. So even the act of breathing comes from God. We have, we have eyes to see. But if God does not give sight to the eyes, the eyes will not see a thing. You'll be blind. So God gives sight and he gives the light to see. So everything still goes back to God. He gives us ears to hear, but we must have the ability to hear in the first place. Even though you have ears, you can still be deaf. You have a mouth, you can be dumb. But God gives the ability. So in worshiping God and thanking God, it's he himself that is still giving you that unction to do it. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. Along this line. To verify this point of view. Because remember we can use the scripture as proof. Hebrews 6 verse 10. Hebrews 6 10. For God is not unjust. To forget your work and labor of love. Which you have shown towards his name. In that you have ministered to the saints. And do minister. And we desire that each one of you. Show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. See? We're talking about promise. All the promises of God are yes and amen. When God made promise to Abraham, because he could not swear by anyone or anything greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you, and in multiply, I will multiply you. A oath. And a promise. God swore an oath to bring about a promise. See? And the promise was his son. Christ would come. He's not slack concerning his promises. Also, let's look at Luke 10, 27. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. This is what it says. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Again, what we give to God, it must come from us, from a loving heart of obedience, not because of merit. We do it because God has first given us grace, He has first given us mercy, He has first given us love, and we now respond. See, we are responsive agents. We respond to God's love. He has given us an ability to respond to his love. See, the impartation of the Holy Spirit gives us that ability to respond, to acknowledge, to worship. Micah 6. I like Micah 6, chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. What does God require from us? Micah tells us in verse, chapter 6, in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With cows a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? Ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy... And to walk humbly with your God. So what does God require? Micah gives the answer. Love justice. Or do justly. Love mercy. And to walk humbly with our God. He's not going to be pleased with burnt offerings. He's not going to be pleased with burnt offerings of, of, of calves a year old. He's not going to be pleased with thousands of rams. 
or 10,000 rivers of oil. He's not going to be pleased with your money. He's not going to be pleased with your labor if you do not have a humble, loving, righteous heart. See, before, before God accepts anything from us, he gives, but he also knows in giving, he transforms us. He transforms our mind. He transforms our heart. He transforms our soul. He transforms our spirit. You know, he, and he gives us the right intent, the right intention. So when we give to God, we give it with the right intentions. You cannot bribe God. You cannot extort anything from God. You give, if you give something to God, with, with, and, and it is not with the right intent, he will not receive it. Or contrary to his prescribed way of doing things, he will not accept it. Like Cain came before God and he took all the fruit of the ground religiously and gave to God and God didn't accept it. Because God had prescribed that you must bring a lamb you must bring a blood offering. And he's bringing the work of his hands. And God did not accept it. So it's not the work of our hands. Our hands, whatever we do for God, must come from a heart of love. You see, our actions are controlled, are, are prescribed by our intentions, our motivations then. You see, you see our, our, when God saves us, when God renews us, he renews the mind, the intent. Of the heart. He searches the intent of the heart. So what you do outwardly must have basis of what is inside of you. That's why we say you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Or go back to Romans chapter 10, where we started when it says that with the mouth, confession is made. But with the heart, man believes on the righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made on the salvation. You can only confess what is in your heart. So therefore, there is no retribution made by God as of death, but of grace. Therefore, it follows and must be understood that God, that God is not indebted to or obligated to anyone. You know, if God, if God punishes, if God threatens pull, pull his wrath is because of retribution for sin. See? So, no retribution by God as of death, but of grace. The soul that sins will die, but the soul that trusts and believes in Christ as Savior will be redeemed and may be washed and be forgiven. God may do what he will with his own. We are his own. We belong to God. God will do or can do or will do or may do what he wills with his own. God can, that's why he says, now let's look at scripture. Romans 9 verse 6 to 13. He can love Jacob and hate Esau. Romans 9 Six. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are Israel. Or uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now uh, they are children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be. That's a promise, right? Mm -hmm. In Isaac shall your seed be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and see I shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by Isaac, our father, for the children not yet being born, now having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, 
But of him who calls, it was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So it follows that God can love one and hate the other. He can choose one and not the other. Reject the Jews and call the Gentiles. Save and justify some and not others. Let Romans 9, go to verse 15. You can see. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the to the to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I must that I may show my power in you, that and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. See? So he can save some and and justify some and choose not to save or justify others. No one can call him to account or judge him or condemn him or say unto him, What dost thou do? Finally, consider this scripture. Hebrews 10. Again, Hebrews 10. Let's go to Hebrews 10. You're going to be soon finished. To 14. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offering and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously seen, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had no pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He takes away the law, that he may establish the promise. Or the first covenant, so he may establish the second covenant. But that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. And every priest stands ministering daily, and offering repeatedly the sin sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. See? One offering, he doesn't take pleasure in sacrifices that man offered, but he took pleasure in this one offering, which was Christ, his son. For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things. Romans 11, Romans 11, 36. That's how it concludes. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen. All things in grace owe their origin to God, as their first cause, as they are produced by him and made for his glory. Every act of grace springs from God's sovereign will and are brought about by his mighty power, his almighty power for the glory of his grace. All things. Everything pertains to election. Redemption, regeneration, justification, sanctification, particularly the counsels and purposes of God are to him and by him and for him. All things originate with God the Father. They are for him, to him, and by him. To whom be glory forever, which will be given to God by angels and men for all eternity, for the perfection of his being, the counsel of his will and the work of his hands in nature and in grace. So we're going to be 
continually forever and ever to all, all eternity, eternity offering unto God praises and worship for his being, for himself. We're not in with this scripture, Hebrews 10, 18. It's a, it's a admonition or it's a, a word of encouragement to you. Therefore, brethren, having bore us to enter the holy, the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us to the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised promise is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law die without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Oh, how much more worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay all, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering, partly with while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you were companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourself in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul have no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the sin of the soul. We have been saved according to God's promises. So let's hold on. Don't draw back. Let us draw near with true heart, true heart of confession, true heart of love, true heart of obedience. Let us run this race with patience. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let us stand fast in the liberty wherewith he has made us free and don't become entangled in the yoke of bondage. May God continue to bless and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that concludes the topic we were dealing with, how inscrutable are God's ways. May God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name. Amen.